ever since I was a small boy, I've been fascinated by stories of the Wild West. What now? What now? Stories of cowboys, Indians, wagon trains, and the gold rush. But for me, those stories are inseparable from the landscapes in which they took place. The mountains, the deserts, and the Great Plains. In this series, I'll be discovering how the early pioneers conquered the mighty mountain ranges and the vast expanses of the Great Plains. How the homesteaders and cowboys overcame extreme temperatures, blizzards, and drought. And I will be finding out how the plants, animals, and natural resources of this unknown wilderness offered unimaginable wealth and opportunities for the new nation. These are the Great Plains, a vast flat grassland in the heart of North America. 200 years ago, nearly all of it was covered in prairie, and there are still places where you can see the plains as they were back then. No trees, little water, just open space. This is a place that experiences extremes, extreme heat in the summer and extreme cold in the winter, and the wind is always blowing here. An incredible landscape, but a very harsh one. To describe this as an ocean of grass is pretty accurate. The wild prairie once stretched all the way from Canada in the north to Mexico in the south. Half a million square miles of wild grassland. In the early 1800s, the Great Plains were virtually unknown to the European settlers on the east coast. They were sparsely populated by tribes of Native Americans drawn to the area by the animals that thrive there. I'm traveling to the northern reaches of the Great Plains in Montana to find out what attracted the Native Americans here in the first place. North American bison, known in America as buffalo. The bison were lured here by the prairie grass, their primary source of food, and with their huge shaggy coats, they're perfectly evolved to thrive in this forbidding climate. It's lovely to watch the calves are all sat down at the moment. There are some very big bulls in that herd with massive humps behind their heads. Quite a sight. Vast herds of these animals once roamed across the plains. There are descriptions of the herds being so long that a fast horseman could ride all day and fail to reach from one end of the herd to the other. They were certainly a key ingredient in this ecosystem. Their grazing didn't harm the landscape. Their woolly fur carried seeds and dispersed them across the landscape. They were an integral part of the health of the prairie. And they were also absolutely central to the life way of the indigenous people that lived here, the Plains Indians. This herd is owned and managed by the Southern Pygan, part of the Blackfeet Nation. At the beginning of the Wild West years, the Plains Indians had a unique dependency upon the buffalo for food, clothing, shelter, and even medicine. The portable homes, or teepees, of the Plains Indians are one of the most evocative icons of the Wild West. You can't find a cowboy movie without one, and they are still used today for ritual ceremonies. I've been invited to witness one of their most significant events, a buffalo hunt. Each year, the Blackfeet harvest 20 buffalo for meat to be shared amongst the tribe. A special ceremony is performed beforehand to give thanks to the animal. We've been given special permission to film the first part of the ceremony, but most of it will go unseen.
can see him all running now. He's right on the other side there. He's right behind his mama right there. Do it there. Mm -hmm. He's thick there. <laughs> wow, look at the size of that room. So, so what they're doing is that they cut through the ribs. And that's behind the diaphragm there. That's where all the, the heart and lungs are. They separated the ribs. That left the diaphragm intact, holding back the guts. Now they're cutting the guts out. What they don't want to do is to spill any of that because it would spoil the meat. And also these pieces all have traditional uses. So you, you have to do this quickly, don't you? Because yeah. you don't want the meat to spoil. Yeah, yeah. Oh, I'm just going to take the kidney and liver and cut the lungs away and everything pretty much. You know, we use and open that up. If somebody wants to stomach, they can take the stomach. That's a kidney right there. Yeah. This is a, you know, more hunters say this is the sweetest part of the liver right here. Blood them. Oh. Right, can we hunt elk and stuff like that? Cut that part off, you know, always give it back. So you give something back to the environment? Yeah, I always give it back, you know, put it up higher, say like on this log. Nothing say a little prayer for uh, good luck, you know, let your shot always be straight. And only take what you need, never more. So it's the spleen? Yeah. How bad though? What will you use that for? Oh. Just throw it in there. Coals and just kind of cover it up and just let it slow cook and eat it like that. Very good, real yeah. good. And in many societies, these be these parts of an animal are discarded. Tell me about the hooves and the legs, uh, Rick. Well, we could use the tips of the hoof for our bells. Yep. If we're a dancer. Yeah. Or for some ceremonies, we use them. We could take these bones right here and use it for our fleshing tools. Yes. So when we're Skinning this, when you're skinning it, we could take that, that bone and push the meat away. We don't need a knife. If we decide to make rawhide out of this, we can make drums out of it. We can make rattles from him. We can do, do many things. Are you going to blow it up? Oh. You should have had Ray do it. Oh, Ray, you want to? Just show me. Just show, just show me. No, I'll go over and blow it. I'm trying to be scared. No, 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 I'm not scared. Just a oh, I'm not. They think I'm scared to blow up this thing. Okay. So, hold it. Hold yeah. your hand like this. Like that, yeah. Yeah, what have we got here? This That's is part of the stomach, isn't it? Yeah, it's like this is yeah. how it'll look. So you can blow it up like that. Yeah. Yep. So then once you're like this, you uh, just dry them. And then you can make bags out of like tobacco bags. Mr. Right. Is that how it, that's how it ends up? Yeah, that's how it So it can either be for <laughs> tobacco or yeah. just carrying water or... It's very good. It's really good to see yeah. this. Very good to see this. And it's all been done in a special way, which is, which yeah. is really neat. But the ancestors of the Blackfeet didn't have the luxury of 4x4s or rifles. Leo and James invite me to see how they would have hunted buffalo 200 years ago with bows and arrows and on horseback. Horses were introduced to the plains by the Spanish in the mid 1600s. It was a momentous encounter for the Indian tribes who were farming on the edges of the plains. They developed phenomenal horsemanship skills. Now they could hunt buffalo more easily 
and more often and follow them wherever they roam. Fish. You ass. enjoyed that, didn't you? Yeah. yeah. You I broke your bow. To... I know. It's the <laughs> first time. Overexcited. Yeah. Can that you was... imagine what that was like for your ancestors? It'd be pretty amazing for them to kill them too, able to shoot them and kill them right there, hauling ass beside them. I mean, you make it look easy, but it's actually quite difficult, isn't it? Yeah. yeah. Getting right up beside them, standing beside them like that, getting one shot between us, that was the hardest part. Well, it was great watching you. Yeah. I bet you want a drink now, don't you? <laughs> yeah, try <Start> of water. <laughs> That was really good. good. I'm really impressed, and riding bareback as well. The Plains Indians turned into nomadic peoples, accompanying the migrating buffalo right across the great grasslands. In the early 1800s, at the beginning of the Wild West years, the Plains Indians had the Great Plains all to themselves, but that was set to change. Stories of rich farmland on the west coast of America were brought back east by early mountain men and fur trappers. By the 1840s, a trickle of white emigrants from the eastern seaboard started to cross the Great Plains, heading for Oregon and California. They became known as the Pioneers. The journey became an annual event, with more and more people crossing the plains to make the 2,000-mile trek west. The route west across America became known as the Oregon Trail, but to think of it as one route would be a mistake. Think of it instead like this frayed rope. On the eastern seaboard, you've got the population, and people are coming literally from every corner. In fact, some are arriving by boat from overseas. They all converge, though, here at Independence, Missouri. This became the staging post for people heading west. And here, families would arrive and wait for others to join them. When there were sufficient families with the right sort of skills, perhaps a doctor, a carpenter, a trail guide, and that they felt they could travel west safely, they'd set off. As they headed west, they went across mountains, the plains, and then across deserts before reaching the west side of the US. And there, they went their separate ways the central part of their journey across the plains is fascinating. They would travel 450 miles, taking a route that took them through some of the driest areas of the Great Plains. And the reason for that is that there was a river. This is the North Platte River. And of course, rivers mean life, and that was the case for the settlers too, because this river didn't just give them direction, a means of navigating across the prairies. It also provided water for their families, for their animals, lush grazing, and very often flat ground to travel along as well. You may wonder, well, why didn't they build boats and go along the river? Well, there's one obvious answer to that. This river flows from west to east. It goes in the wrong direction. Whatever, it was a lifeline and they followed it. The banks of the River Platte guided the steady stream of wagons across the plains. Then, in 1849, gold was discovered in California and the stream became a flood. The Great Plains became the stage for one of the greatest mass human migrations in history. As many as half a million emigrants made their way along the Oregon Trail. I've caught up with the Oregon Trail on the western reaches of the Great Plains at Guernsey in Wyoming. Here the wagons were forced away from the riverbed for a few miles. It meant that virtually every wagon had to cross a ridge of soft sandstone at exactly the same spot. These extraordinary marks in the ground are the ruts left by the wheels 
of thousands, perhaps tens of thousands of wagons going through just here. And you find them all through this area. There's one here. When I look at this rut, it looks like a left-hand wheel. So you have to imagine a wagon canted right over it gives you some sense of their urgency to get through. And in fact, you can see a cut mark here. It's very faint. It's quite eroded now. Gosh. <laughs> now look at that. Oh, you can really, you can feel the drama as they're coming through here. There'd probably be somebody near here looking to make sure that the axle doesn't grind out on that, uh, that barrier there. Inching them forwards. Yes, yes, yes. Oh, stop. Maybe trying to chock up the wheel to get through there. You really get a sense here of overcrowding, of frustration. Imagine, if you will, the animals, their hooves slipping if the ground is wet, trying to get through here. Of a family desperate, children crying. Maybe a wheel is shed or an axle is broken and one of the routes is temporarily blocked with half of humanity pressing from behind. Get out of the way, we want to go west. You really can feel that here. It's in a remarkable place. Further west along the Oregon Trail, I meet up with wagon master Kim Merchant and his two daughters to get a sense of what it must have been like to experience the journey. Now, we've got this wagon, and this is the, one of the uh, quite large as wagons go. I've seen some even narrower than this. Yeah. But you've got to take in here all of your possessions. Your, 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 let, me, let me think. Your toolkit, maybe some luxuries, but not many. Things that you want to take to start your new life. But you've got to have in here your food and your medicine to take you across the continent. There are six to eight people in a family, so they would, they would have to bring so many pounds of flour and so many pounds of bacon and so many pounds of salted pork or salted beef. And, uh, you know, they didn't carry canned goods because they, they were heavy. But they did have a process where they dehydrated vegetables and made bricks. And th that's how most people took theirs. Or they dried them, they prepared a whole year ahead of time, dried out the vegetables. This would be full, and you know, that's why along the way when the animals got weak, they would throw things out because it was just too heavy. And it was always something like, you know, grandma's organ or mom's favorite uh, dresser, you know. I mean, they just threw it out. It was more important to get there than take that stuff with Sure. Them. I mean, that's the thing that astonishes me. These, these weren't, you know, explorers. They're families. These, these are just right. ordinary people, and every age group traveled in, on these journeys. Well, I see your daughters have got the best seats, haven't they? They've got the best seats in the house. They do. They do. I think we want to get going. OK. Come on, Holly. Holly, get up. You can see why the pioneers called their wagons prairie schooners in the hope they would sail safely to the other side of this great sea of grass. With the wagons packed full, incredibly, most of the emigrants made the entire 2,000-mile journey on foot. The flat landscape meant that when they set up camp after a hard day's walk, they were often still within sight of their previous night's campsite. So how far would you travel in a day at this pace? Well, they, probably this kind of weather and everything's right and animals are well fed. You could probably travel 12, 15 miles a day. Well, it's a healthy day walking. People have been quite foot sore. What about the weather? Because they're pretty exposed out here. Well, the weather in, in all the seasons is pretty extreme, even in the dead of summer when they would be approaching this place. Uh, you know, thunder, thunderstorms crop up in the afternoon, the wind comes up and got canvas there and you can have pretty severe hailstorms as the prairie warms up. The geology here is fascinating, but look at that smooth rock there. Yeah, it's just a big piece of granite and that's Independence Rock. That's Independence Rock. That's Independence Rock. Now, that's a good sign, isn't it? That's a good sign. We're right on schedule. If they made it here by the 4th of July, at the speed they traveled, they could make it over 
the mountain passes before the snow flew. So you had to be here by the 4th of July yeah. to be yeah. served to get across the Yeah, mountain. within a day or two, you know. That, that was kind of the rule of thumb, so to speak. Well, we're in pretty good shape because it's the 3rd of good July. Shape. We're a day ahead of time. But it really was a time for celebration. Some of the ladies would save their last eggs, their last pound of sugar to make a pound cake, and they'd uh, tear the boards off the side of their wagons to make a long table for yep. all the food to put on, you know. I can understand that. And what about music? Well, yeah, music was a big part of the the, the wagon camps in the evening. Some would pull out a fiddle, and, and some would pull out a guitar, maybe a banjo, and mandolin, and away they'd go. Whoa, let's stop here a second. Now that's what they were waiting for, that's what we've been waiting for. If you were on the trail, that would be like coming home. And especially after you've traveled, you know, you've, you've been wet, you've been cold, you've been sunburned, you've been thirsty, you've been hungry, and you know, you've been sick, and then you finally, finally get to a place where there's some cause for some celebration. Well, I think we should make our way down to the shindig. I think, think so too. It's time to celebrate. Pioneers on this long and risky journey shared the basic human desire to be remembered. 5,000 of them inscribed their names here using lamp black, oil, axle grease, buffalo grease, anything that could be daubed on the rock, which became known as the Great Register of the Desert. The elation of reaching the rock on Independence Day was quickly forgotten. After two months on the trail, the pioneers were still only halfway to Oregon or California. Now, Hollywood would have you think that the biggest threat to the people who came down this very trail in their wagons was Indian attack. And certainly that did occasionally happen, but it was by far the least of your worries. There were a lot of other things that could get you. In the baking hot summers, you could die from heat stroke. You could be drowned crossing the rivers. You could be seriously injured if a wagon turned over or an animal bolted, or if someone had an accident with firearms. That accounted for a lot of deaths. Then there were the diseases. Every disease of humanity came down this very trail, chickenpox, mumps, measles, you name them. And the one that was on everybody's lips was cholera. That was the one they feared the most. It's estimated that 6% of the people who headed west died on this very trail. That's 20,000 people, buried mostly in simple scrapes along the trail. It's staggering to think how many perished on the way. One hundred miles west of Independence Rock, I find a stark reminder of the toll this landscape took on those pioneers. I find this gravesite particularly moving. Perhaps it's the isolation in this desolate landscape, or the fact that it belongs to a young Englishwoman who'd come all the way from Suffolk, Charlotte Dancy. She died here in her early 30s with her infant whilst in childbirth. When she died, her husband dug a grave for her and for the infant Joseph. There wasn't a coffin, just a chest lid with brass hinges. It was the best they could afford. It was all they had with them. And her husband laid her to rest with her favorite possession, a string of blue glass beads. But beyond Charlotte's grave, you can see the snow-capped peaks of the Rocky Mountains. For the pioneers who had made it this far, they still had a third of their journey to go, but at least they had made it across the Great Plains. It's a sad fact that just a few years later, Charlotte could have made the journey safely. In 1869, after six years of frantic construction, America's first transcontinental railway was completed. 
The train annihilated concepts of distance and time. Once, the continent had taken months to cross. But with America's east and west coasts connected by rail, those 3,000 miles of mountain, prairie and desert could be crossed in under a week. This is what would change the West forever, the railroads. With the railroads established and a lot of propaganda encouraging people to come West, there was a flood of humanity into the prairies. 1.6 million people headed West, fired with this thought of the Homestead Act. In 1861, the US government passed the Homestead Act, offering 160 acres of free land to pretty much anyone willing to farm it. The pioneers had seen the plains as a barrier to get across. Now, thousands of homesteaders flooded onto them to settle and make a new life here. Do you hear that sound? That is the sound of money. And of course, this was the homesteaders' vision crops as far as the eye could see. When they saw all this grassland, they thought, we can turn that into farmland. There was just one problem. How do you build a house in a land with no trees? Homesteaders weren't wealthy people. They couldn't afford to import lumber, let alone bricks, to build with. But of course, necessity is the mother of invention. And some bright spark said, well, why don't we use the grassland itself? If we cut turf, we could use that like bricks to build buildings. And that's exactly what they did. It's estimated that there were over a million sod houses built all across the prairie. This remarkable building is probably one of the rarest in North America. This is a sod house. It was built right at the beginning of the 1880s. And you can see very clearly the bricks made of turf and they're are some roots. They found that the roots of the prairie grass made for very strong turf bricks and they'd lay them so the roots were facing upwards and they would grow into each other a little bit. These bricks got the nickname of Nebraska marble. That's how strong they were. The interior of the building is really in a remarkable state of preservation. This building was inhabited until 1952. Since then it's been derelict but you can see how well it was taken care of in the fact that it's preserved. One of the secrets was that a tin roof was put on in later years, but we have a graphic picture of what life was like in this house. A house comprised of two rooms. Eight children and three grandchildren were born in this building. Can you imagine a family of eight living together in this tiny space? The walls, obviously, were a great home for rodents and birds. And the children would sometimes find that their socks had been stolen by rodents and taken off into the walls, into their nests. Before this roof was put on, there was a, a, a roof of wood covered with heavy black paper and sods on top of that. And when it rained, sometimes it would leak and the father would have to rush out and put soil over where the leaks were. But there were certain advantages. The sod was a wonderful insulator, so in the extreme heat of summer, the interior of the house was always cool, and in winter, it was remarkably warm. God, really atmospheric. <laughs> There's still life in here now, look at that. <laughs> Small communities like this deserted hamlet of Montrose in Nebraska began to emerge in the rural interior of the Great Plains. I've come here to meet up with homestead historian Tammy Luttrell to find out more about the people who took up the challenge of farming this landscape. I've got some pictures here 
um, that I put in this scrapbook that were taken by um, Solomon Butcher, who was the, this amazing photographer who, mm -hmm. who photographed many of these homesteads. I mean, thank, it's great that he did. I mean, it was, it was, Amazing, yes. And, I mean, they're, they're quite remarkable, aren't they? I mean, they, 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 you, you get a sense of pride in these families. I mean, what sort of people came out here? Well, uh, anyone that was 21 years old could sign up as long as they were the head of a household. So it could be a single woman or a widowed woman. Um, it could be a newly freed slave. Usually they were people that had moved to earlier frontiers. They were people that were fairly adventurous, but not always. Sometimes they were um, like a young farmer in a family of eight boys, and he knew that he was not going to get the family farm back east. It was too small. And so he had the opportunity to have land for himself, you know, to start his own place. It would be immigrants uh, in eastern cities that are just jam-packed and they're wanting to own their own land or it would be European immigrants who were always tenant farmers or could not afford to buy the land to start their own farms. You'll notice in most of the pictures there are a few things that they're very proud of. Uh, watermelons was one thing. You see a lot of watermelons and what that is saying is um, they're taking these pictures to send to their families back in you know, wherever they came from. Because oftentimes, once they moved out here, the separation was permanent. They never saw their families again. And so these were photographs to show them, we're in Nebraska, we made it, we grew watermelons. <laughs> then there's this astonishing photograph. Now, I, I'm, I'm assuming that they must have built a frame house by now because it's a very high angle. Well, actually, what this picture is about is she was so horrified to have her family know that she lived in a Saudi, a dirt house, that she had Solomon and her husband carry that pump organ out into the barnyard, and Butcher climbed the windmill and got that picture uh, off of the top of the windmill. So there's the elevated mm -hmm. position. So she has her possession. She, she's very proud of the organ, and then in the background you see there's pigs and cattle and horses and everything that he has and different implements, farm implements, to show, you know, what he's accumulated. Really, this country was built on the backs of ordinary people, people who came out with a dream in their hearts. And when they found no trees to build with, they, they literally lifted the turf and made their homes from it. Lots of ordinary people, lots of different cultures. So it was, it was a fabric of different people that came here. It's the fabric of America. Mm-hmm, and hard work, and luck. <laughs> The new frontier was there for the taking, but having made it here, the settlers still faced a huge challenge, how to farm the virgin prairie. Some of them had arrived from Europe with farming experience, but the soil and climate, even the grass on the Great Plains, were different from anything they'd ever seen before. This is short grass prairie. You find that in the most arid areas, but there are places on the plains where there's slightly more rainfall, and there you get the tall grass species, and they are recorded as having grown all the way up to chest height if you're on horseback. It's astonishing. But when you look at any grass, really you're just seeing the tip of the iceberg. You need to look underground to see what's really going on. Take a look at this. This is a species called switchgrass. That is a life-size photograph showing just how extensive the root system is. In one square meter on the prairie, there can be five miles of roots. That's what made the ground so productive. But it also caused problems. The roots were so dense and so tightly packed that when farmers attacked them with iron plows, the plows broke. It was only when steel plows came into the prairies that this land could be turned into farmland. For many settlers, the challenges proved too great. Up to an estimated 60% of homesteaders admitted defeat and returned home. But for those who remained, the American dream 
became a reality, and their descendants are still thriving here today. I've traveled to Custer County in Nebraska to meet Kevin Cooksley, who still lives on the land where his great-grandfather's sod house once stood. So now we're coming up to where the sod house was. Yep. Uh, yep, the depression is there. You can go right to where the well was. The ground actually feels a little harder here, so that would have been tamped down, wouldn't it? It would have been, yes. It, uh, Alex Perney, my great-grandfather, uh, emigrated here in 1876 from Edinburgh, Scotland. Do you have any photographs of it? The one that was made famous by Solomon Butcher, this would have been Alex Perney. A great big whiskery With, moustache. Amazing. Yes, it, impressive. isn't it? And in it, you can see the sod house. When they were living in that sod house, what was life like? There were no trees, so when you arrived here, firewood, would have been in short supply. So you used the dried uh, buffalo chips, cow pies, for fuel. Once you started growing crops, corn, primarily, uh, you could burn the corn cobs. They must have been incredibly isolated. Yes, they were. The things that come to mind, you know, you worry about the hostels, you worry about the storms, you worry about the poisonous snakes, you worry about injury because where do you go for a doctor, where do you go for medicine? And, uh, and of course, childbirth as well. And childbirth, yeah. How many, you go to the old cemeteries and look how many headstones have children that died when they were one month old, two months old, or women that died in childbirth. And what made him stop here? Well, that's a good question, and I've asked myself that. The best answer I've been able to come up with, they found a place that reminded them of home. I imagine that when Alex got here and he looked around and he got up on this hill and he's got the creek down below, he's got 360 degrees visibility all the way around. He's high enough, he doesn't have to worry about floods. He can see the bad weather, he can see the, you know, if there's someone coming, he can see them coming. And I think he, he looked around at the hills and he thought, this is, this looks like home too. I've been fortunate that I came into possession of a couple of his journals, and he writes in there in pencil. Did you read a little bit? Here, 1898, page 86, he writes about building this frame house. The first load of lumber was hauled by Alex Perney from Berwyn to build the first frame house in this valley. James Shores, a colored man from Westerville, came and built the foundation, but winter came on us very suddenly and came very cold and stormy, so the foundation stood all winter and the first load of, first nail of this house driven on March 2nd, 1899. Then we moved into this new frame house after living 14 years in the old sod house. And, to, and the frame house, which is still standing, how far would he have had to bring that lumber? He writes in his journal of going to Grand Island, Nebraska to get the lumber to build a house. And Grand Island is 90 miles away. It would have involved a week-long trip by wagon. That's if there were no problems. It's amazing. You can really get the sense of his pride he, when he talks about driving the first nail. You know, it's a, this is the, a, 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 a new departure. It's a new stage in the family's success. And this frame house, is, this is almost a townhouse from from San Francisco, albeit on a smaller scale. It's, it's very grand, isn't it? Very, very grand. I mean, complete with a balcony and a walk-out door. Yeah. So he can step outside and view his kingdom, <laughs> if you will. <laughs> he had to feel like a man who had arrived. Yeah. As the homesteaders began to settle the plains in earnest, the expansion of the railroads continued to pick up steam. Farming equipment started to be shipped in by rail, helping the homesteaders tame the wild landscape. Of course, there were still problems. With an average of less than 38 centimeters of rain falling on the plains each year, finding enough water to expand agriculture was tough. But the ever resourceful farmers found a solution to this too. Extracting water from hand dug wells was hard work. So they turned to the natural resource they had in plenty, the relentless plains wind. 
Windmills like this are a common feature in this landscape. It's wonderful technology. It's very simple and very effective and can be long lasting. This pump has been functioning since 1893. That, of course, made life so much easier for the homesteaders. What they didn't realize, though, is that they were tapping into an incredible natural resource, the Ogallala Aquifer. It's porous rock underground here that, like a sponge, holds an enormous amount of water. In fact, it spreads under the prairie for an area of eight states. The combination of this huge hidden water supply and the new windmill technology enabled the homesteaders to alter the frontier beyond recognition. Incredibly, within one generation, the vast prairies had turned almost entirely to farmland. The new farms were supported by America's railroad boom. By 1890, six huge transcontinental lines straddled the country, with hundreds of branch lines connecting isolated communities. It opened up new opportunities for trade right across the Great Plains. Towns like Dodge City developed at the rail heads where the tracks ended. Saloons, stores and brothels quickly followed the dollar. This auction is a lasting legacy of a beef bonanza triggered in the mid-1800s. Dodge City, originally Fort Dodge, was transformed by the railroad's arrival in 1872. Now that the local beef could be shipped back to the new nation's growing cities in the east, demand was enormous. Sold of a dollar thirty-nine, put one eighty-five on eight. Here, family, thank you. Dodge City has to be one of the most iconic towns in the Wild West. The original Front Street burned down in the past. Fires were a common problem in frontier towns. Today, there's this tourist approximation, and it gives a really good feel of what life would have been like back in the 1800s. But what a lot of people don't realize is that Dodge City was actually founded on one of the saddest stories in the Wild West. As the railroad continued advancing east, its newly laid tracks cut right through the migratory path of the great southern buffalo herd. It sparked a massive and lucrative trade in buffalo hunting and tanning here in Dodge City. Historian Noel Airy explains how the arrival of the train would mark the beginning of the end for the buffalo. There was a big demand for leather. And if you stop to think, uh, we didn't have plastic. So furniture, uh, harness of all kinds, saddles, coats, uh, rugs. Um, and then as the industry began to build, they would have one large power plant and long shafts going from that and belts that came down to power all the machinery. And they found buffalo hide made a wonderful belt. The railroad made it possible to market all of these products that they got from the buffalo. Buffalo hunters flocked to Dodge City, where they could earn up to $3 per hide. A, a really good hunter could shoot up to, if everything was right, 100 buffalo in a day. A hundred in a day. Uh -huh. Horizon to horizon, there were buffalo. And uh, so it wasn't hard in the beginning to uh, find buffalo. One hunter shot 1,500 buffalo in seven days. And 1,500 bison. 1,500 in bison in a week. There was a lot more people hunting than I think a lot of people thought. Uh, I know just in this immediate area, they estimated 5,000 hunters. And of course, they had good guns. This was just after the Civil War. And uh, the sharp rifle is heavy. It's uh, 14 to 16 pounds, and they come in all different calibers and uh, different barrel lengths. But they were accurate, and they were well made. And uh, if you had a Sharps, you, you had the Cadillac of, of guns at the time. And, th uh, and this is a genuine, this is a historical piece. Yes, this is an old Sharps. I don't know the history behind it. It's been awfully well taken care of. Most of them <laughs> don't look that good. It's amazing. It's a very, very heavy barrel. Sure. And uh, when they were hunting, 
they tried to get as close as they could to a herd. And they'd watch them a little while and determine which was the leader, which was usually an old cow. And uh, they could watch by just how the group was reacting to her. And that's the one they tried to shoot first. If they shot him in the heart, they, they apparently jumped and caused all kinds of a commotion. And that caused the whole group then to, to run. But if they could shoot them in the lungs, uh, they would bleed to death pretty fast. And what they'd do, they'd stand there a while and bleed and get very sick and lay down. And that was it. The other buffalo might come over and smell them, but she didn't leave and she was the leader. So they stayed and continued grazing. And the idea was to keep them within rifle range as long as they could to kill as many as they could. That's fascinating. So I've got this impression now of the professional buffalo hunter, but it wasn't all like that, was it? There was an element of hunting for sport as well. Oh, sure. And uh, probably the most famous or infamous example of that was on the Kansas Pacific Railroad to the north. The other transcontinental railroad that went through about 100 miles north of us. And uh, they touted, advertised shooting buffalo from the train. And if they came to a herd, they would simply slow the train way down and everybody shot. And Kansas Pacific did have their own taxidermy department, uh, which mounted heads. And there was uh, there is a picture that shows the front of the building with a number of heads there. And I'm sure it was a PR type thing. Um, it was a, a lark. Going to the Old West was the thing to do. Shooting buffalo was part of the trip. And the buffalo never had a chance. Abandoned buffalo carcasses littered the plains. They slowly decayed into giant piles of sun-bleached bones, making the prairie so white some said it looked as if it were covered in snow. It's estimated that the bones of 31 million buffalo were collected up and shipped back east to be ground into fertilizer. By the end of the 1800s, the great buffalo herds had effectively vanished from the Great Plains. If you know where to look, there are marks across this landscape that tell its history. Because this depression in the ground is not man-made. This was made by buffalo, because this was once a wallow. It's hard to imagine, because there are no buffalo here today. In 1800, it's estimated that there were between 30 and 60 million buffalo roaming wild and free across the prairie. By 1895, there were less than 1,000. It was inconceivable to the Native Americans that the buffalo could have been gone, but they were. And for them, that had a catastrophic impact on their way of life. Without the buffalo, the Plains Indians simply could not survive. After years of increasing conflict with settlers and the US Army, they were forced onto reservations. There was now nothing to stand in the way of the frontier as it swept west. With no buffalo and with the Plains Indians restricted to reservations, the prairie grass was now up for grabs. It wasn't long before industrious ranchers from the south realized this was excellent grazing ground for their cattle. I've come to Moore Ranch a working ranch southwest of Dodge City. These are your classic longhorn cattle. They're beautiful, aren't they? They originally brought here by the Spanish and farmed by the Mexicans. But as the United States established its borders and the Mexicans retreated, large herds of these were left in the prairies. But it wasn't until the buffalo were wiped out that there was really an opportunity for these cattle. There was a niche created that they stepped into. That coupled with the fact that during the Civil War, a lot of the farms were left untended, created an opportunity for these animals to go feral and really breed up. 
by the time the farmers returned, at the end of the Civil War in 1865, they found upwards of five million longhorn cattle loose on the plains. That would usher in a new era, the era of the cattle drive, and bring with it that iconic figure of the West, the cowboy. <laughs> The ranch is owned by the Moore family, third generation ranchers who come from a long tradition of cowboys. Hey, hey, hey. Today, Joe has promised me a taste of life in the saddle. We'll be driving his cattle to pasture. A sort of beginner's version of the great cattle drives of the Old West. When the stampede starts, you're on your own. <laughs> the 1870s and 80s were the heyday of the cattle drive as cowboys drove great herds of cattle north across the unfenced plains to railheads in Kansas or Nebraska, where they would be transported to market. These cattle drives would mean spending over three months in the saddle covering distances of up to 2,000 miles. Heat, dust, quicksand, stampedes, snakes, drought, lightning, and dust storms were everyday problems. It's no surprise cattle driving was a young man's sport. The average age of a cowboy was 22. They worked for a dollar a day. Cowboy was really just a hired man on a horse, but he captured the imagination of dime novels and Hollywood. Even today, much of that myth lives on. Joining me at the campfire, is Jim Hoy, an expert on cowboy folk life. Can you just give me a description of what a cattle drive was? Well, it was gathering together a herd of cattle. Typical size was between 2,000 and 3,000 cattle. You'd have 10 cowboys, 10 drovers could handle those, that number of cattle easily. And then <clears throat> you'd have a, a chuck wagon, to carry the food, uh, flour, bacon, beans, things like that. Uh, also any medical supplies. You'd gather these together in Texas, and they'd start them off. Most of them would start in the spring. As the grass began to get green down there, they'd follow the grass north, in a sense. The first day, they'd drive maybe 20 miles. Second day, maybe 15, 20, 25 miles. Two reasons. One, get those longhorns far away from home. They got a strong homing instinct. You don't want them going back where they were. Also, get them kind of used to the rhythm of the trail. If you got them at the very first so they'd handle well and, and get the rhythm of the trail, you could walk a thousand miles with those cattle. They'd weigh more when they got to Kansas than when they left Texas. But if they started stampeding the first day or two, they might run all the way and they'd lose weight as they did it. After you go those first couple of days, you'd slow down. Fifteen miles was a big day after that. You let the cattle graze grass and then you'd put them in camp. And you're usually in camp ten hours a night. You get into the camp, you bed the cattle down, leave two cowboys out there to kind of watch them, ride around them, and when it got dark, you'd sing or hum so the cattle would know you were there, and the belief was that it kept them quieted down. It was like a lullaby. That's fascinating. Yeah. I, I read somewhere that sometimes the cowboys would fall asleep in the saddle. They did. They did. I mean, if you go, and, and the cattle are stampeding, running, causing trouble, you might go two, three, four days without ever getting off your horse or maybe changing horses, but not getting a chance to sleep. And they would sometimes, when they're out riding night herd and they're just dead tired, take some of their smoking tobacco and rub it in their eyes, burn their eyes to make them stay awake. Wow, drastic measures. And if they had steers that wanted to run and stampede all the time, they'd sometimes rope them time down and sew their eyelids closed so they couldn't see where they were going and kept them from leading the other cattle astray and running. Amazing. Yeah. I've never come across stories of them carrying compasses. No. Uh, at night, when they'd pull into a camp when they're on the trail, 
if there was a moon and stars out, the chuck wagon always pointed the, the tongue t toward the North Star. So the next day, they'd know which way to go. And if it was a foggy day and they, you know, you get lost going in circles pretty easily, they'd tie a, about a 60, 80 foot lariat rope on the axle of that chuck wagon and he could look back every once in a while and if that rope was curving, he knew he is, and so he'd go back so he was pulling that rope straight, knew he was going north. One of the things that fascinates me about the West is the way things come and go. It, it really seems like little bursts of gunpowder going off left, right and centre. There's a flash of something and then it dies out. So you, the horse arrives, the Indian go after the buffalo with the mm. horse, then the buffalo's gone. And yeah. that's the same true of the cowboy, isn't it? Yeah, in a sense. Uh, two major things contributed to that um, technology and barbed wire. The railroad, of course, the cowboy was created by technology of the railroads, but that didn't end the open range. Barbed wire did. Uh, 1878, it's invented, patented. 1883, they began to fence up the XIT ranch in Texas. But barbed wire, they could fence off the water holes. They could fence off a pasture. And if that pasture didn't have water, the windmill could provide that water, if, as long as there's groundwater underneath. But that open range era is over by more or less 1890. A wide open life with the wide open spaces. Uh, when they fenced it, it really it changed the nature of ranching, changed the nature of cowboy very quickly. You think of the cowboy it defines America as its folk hero, but that open range cowboy, a bare generation, 25 years. Come along, boys, and listen to my tale. I'll tell you the troubles of the old Chisholm Trail. Come a tie, a yippee, yippee, yay, yippee, yay. Come tie, a yippee, yippee, yay. Started up the trail October 23rd. Started up the trail with the two you heard. Come a tie, a yippee, yippee, yay, yippee, yay. When the Wild West hit the prairies, it was like a stampede beyond any human control. It burned across this light landscape, changing everything. By the end of the 1800s, you could no longer find dark ribbons of buffalo herds flowing across this landscape, followed by Indians. They themselves were now confined to reservations. Even cowboys were no longer making cattle drives because the landscape had been fenced. The wild grasses were replaced now by crops. But in a strange way, the landscape shaped the nation. And I think that here, in the very heart of America, in the adversity and the tenacity that was shown, the very nature of the American personality was defined. Thank you.